Born into slavery in 1862, Ida B. Wells moved to Memphis, a bustling town on the banks of the Mississippi River, to earn a living as a teacher to support herself and her immediate family. Like many African Americans and whites after the Civil War, Wells saw Memphis as a thriving city offering economic, social, and educational advancement. For a growing African American community, Memphis held hope for them for a brighter future. That is, until Memphis, like the rest of the South, rolled back hard-fought civil rights advances achieved by the Civil War and Reconstruction. For Wells, things took an even uglier turn in 1892, when three African-American men, Thomas Moss, a dear friend of Wells, William Stewart, and Calvin McDowell were lynched. Wells wrote about this lynching in her paper, The Free Speech. Her newspaper reports condemned whites who condoned lynching and threw many white Memphians into a frenzy. In response, they destroyed her office and printing press and threatened Wells, who was on a train ride to New York at the time, of being killed herself if she returned to Memphis. Some experiences break people, others make them. This experience made Ida B. Wells. After being driven from Memphis, Wells launched an anti-lynching crusade that took her before international audiences. She rallied support from them to demand that the United States stop lynchings of African Americans. Wells was one of the first investigative journalists to use statistics to highlight the severity and frequency of lynchings. Although her life's work was launched under the most horrific of circumstances, Wells, who died in 1932, used the remainder of her life to fight for the rights of African Americans, women, and the poor. Wells is now seen throughout the world as an international role model and a crusader for justice. Tonight, we welcome Miss Ida B. Wells back to Memphis. My dear Miss Wells, let me give you thanks for your faithful paper on the lynch abomination now generally practiced against colored people in the South. There has been no word equal to it in convincing power. I've spoken, but my word is feeble in comparison. You give us what you know and testify from actual knowledge. You've dealt with the facts with cool, painstaking fidelity and left those naked and uncontradicted facts to speak for themselves. Can you imagine a letter from Mr. Frederick Douglass congratulating me on my excellent work? Just as he worked tirelessly to expose the evils of slavery, I must continue my work exposing the vile practice of lynching. It drives me. I've always hungered for knowledge, even when it was too painful to accept. It's a family trait. I was born into slavery, yet my parents ensured that my brothers, sisters, and I received the best education they could provide until their untimely deaths. The yellow fever that swept through the Mississippi Delta took them and left me to take charge of the rest of my family. I left my own education behind to return home and care for my siblings, taking a job as a teacher to keep us all together. But eventually, my brothers were old enough to be apprenticed and began to build a life for themselves. And I was free to move to the big city of Memphis 
to take a teaching position here. But teaching was never as rewarding for me as learning. And ultimately, it was investigative journalism which became my true passion. I began to attend the Memphis Lyceum, where we held readings of the newspaper, The Evening Star. And I began to write for the paper under the name Iola, and discovered that journalism was my true calling. I wrote on the injustices of all kinds. The injustice applied to me as an African American and as a woman. And then the lynching at the curve happened. They lynched my dear friend, Thomas Moss, and his associates, simply for running a successful business while being men of color. And make no mistake, this was an economically driven attack, not some savage form of justice. And my pen and I went to work with an even greater purpose. But let's see what else Mr. Douglas has written to me. Brave woman, you've done your people and mine a service, which can neither be weighed nor measured. But alas, even crime has power to reproduce itself and create conditions favorable to its own existence. It sometimes seems we are deserted by earth and heaven, yet we must still think, speak, and work, and trust in the power of a merciful God for final deliverance. Very truly and gratefully yours, Douglas. He says we must still think, speak, and work for final deliverance. And I wholeheartedly agree. Never thought I'd return to Memphis. This is where my anti-lynching campaign began, and it came at a cost. While I was away in New York, the white public of Memphis attacked my paper, the free speech, and ultimately destroyed it. My frank and honest writing cost me my livelihood. But had I come back then, it would have likely cost me my life, too. But now the princess of the press is back in Memphis to discover how my work concerning racial justice, economic disparities, and gender equality has continued. Memphis's role in all of these efforts cannot be overstated. One must change the South to change the nation. Oof, I should write that down. Where's my notebook? What a lovely Victorian dress. Well, yours is lovely too, although a bit oddly styled. I don't think I'm the one wearing the strange dress. <laughs> this is the 21st century. 21st century? What year is it? It's 2019. 2019? Yes. Gosh, I guess it has been a minute since I was last in Memphis. I was last here in 1892. Who are you? Ida B. Wells, formerly of the Free Speech. Ida B. Wells, the civil rights icon and anti-lynching crusader? Yes. Oh, wow. Can you tell me what's being done to promote social justice in Memphis today? I would love to tell you what <laughs> is, I'm doing with the Hooks Institute to promote social justice in Memphis. I'm executive director of the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change at the University of Memphis. Our mission is teaching, studying, and promoting civil rights and social change. We do this in a number of ways. Community engagement, direct community interventions, research initiatives, lecture series, book awards. We do all of this to promote civil rights and social justice. What an extraordinary platform for change. Do you do this work alone? Oh, no. I have a very talented and committed staff. In fact, we're going to a dinner tonight, a really fancy dinner where our donors are going to be there. 
where we explain what we do throughout the year, and all of them are gonna come by here on their way to the dinner. And I'd love if you have an opportunity to speak with them and interview them in, oh, as part of your work. I would love to meet them. Oh, wait a minute. I see my associate director, Roy Trammell, and Christian Willette, who's a Haney student. I'll have them stop by and talk to you. This is turning out beautifully. I wanted to do an investigation on how social justice is turning out in Memphis today. I've run into a whole team dedicated to that pursuit. Good evening. Daphne tells us that you're Ida B. Wells. Yes. Is that true? Are you Miss Trammell? Yes, I am. And this is Christian Willette. He's one of the students in our Hamey program. What's Hamey? Hamey is the Hooks African American Male Initiative. It's an academic enrichment program at the University of Memphis where we help to improve the retention and graduation rates of African American males at the university. We have three pro primary focuses. They are academic achievement, career readiness, and personal development. Well, education is of great importance. When my brothers were old enough to be apprenticed, I helped them gain their apprenticeships just to navigate the world as educated professionals. How do you help aid the Haney students? Well, we have a number of activities. Our primary activity is a monthly enrichment session. We have that to help students with their academic progress, with success tips. We also help them with their personal development. And we go over different topics that help them, such as uh, decision making, goal setting. And we even help them with activities like public speaking. Now, I'm sure these activities are very helpful, yeah. as the road might not be that easy. Exactly. Um, like many college students, Hamey students sometimes have challenges. That can be financial problems, it can be employment, even housing and food insecurity. But we don't leave them hanging. We help them with intensive case management, where we help them navigate these challenges because we care about the students' overall well-being. But I have to say, we don't do it by ourselves. There's a lot of faculty and staff at the University of Memphis that help us. And every year we have a luncheon for our Hamey students where they get to interact with the faculty staff and get to know people that can support them in their academic pursuits. And you mentioned you help them prepare for their careers as well. We do, because we know that when they graduate from the University of Memphis, they're going to have great jobs. So we try to prepare them for that. We help them with resume writing, interviewing skills, and even the soft skills like uh, networking and professional etiquette. We even give the students their first business cards. And I'm excited to say that many of our Hamey students have their firsts with us, their first time going to a community play. Uh, many students took their first flight because of being in Hamey. In fact, one of the students, his very first flight was because he was in a partnership program with Hamey and the Study Abroad Office. So his first flight was to study abroad in Japan. And so, young man, are you a part of this program? Tell me your name and more about your experience. Well, yes, my name is Christian Ouellette. And being a part of Hamey has been such an amazing experience. Coming to the University of Memphis, I was worried that I wouldn't have anywhere to fit in. But Hamey gave me an opportunity to be a part of a great organization on campus that pushes and motivates me as a student. Hamey has also helped me form brotherhoods. These are friends I go to the rec with and play basketball. I go eat lunch with at the UC. And I also go to the library and wouldn't study. Hamey also pushes me in the classroom. We have to give progress reports to Ms. Rory and back to our teachers to know how we're doing in each and every class. Hamey has also taught me about financing, budgeting, how to live in the real world. These are things I can teach to my friends, my families, people in the community who may not know about these things. Being a part of Hamey has taught me so many great things, and I can't wait to see what Hamey has for me in the future. Now, a strong support system is of great importance when attaining an education. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Willett? I definitely will. Ms. Wells, it has been a delight talking with you. We appreciate your time, but we do have a dinner to go to, so we're going to go on our way and wish you a great evening. Nice talking with you. You as well. Yes, nice meeting you. Did you see Ms. Rory and, and Christian Ouellette? Yes, I did. How extraordinary. Young men like that are going to be the leaders of the future. I have no doubt. Yes. We at the Hooks Institute are so proud of young men like Christian Ouellette and other young men enrolled in the Hamey program. Now, of course, I've always known that women will also be great leaders. I mean, just look at me. I was the first African-American woman to own and operate my own newspaper. And I was very active in the women's suffrage movement. 
Oh, yes, you were. You were amazing. And the really amazing part about you, Ms. Wells, is that you were fighting for the rights of African American men and women, and especially the right of African American men to participate in the electoral process. At the time you launched your anti lynching crusade, you yourself could not vote. The 15th Amendment didn't allow women to vote. Yeah, I did fight for the women's right to vote, and that got passed in 1920 with the 19th Amendment, but what has the Hooks Institute done about this history? Well, voting remains very important to America today. Despite the gains of the 1800s and the 1900s and the 1960s civil rights movement, people in the United States still fight for the right to vote even today. The Hooks Institute tries to memorialize that history and explain the significance of civic participation by everyone, and especially the need for students on campus to register to vote. So in September 2018, the Hooks Institute had an exhibit titled, Uplift the Vote. Everybody has a voting story, what is yours? And the exhibit focused on the history of the right to vote or the struggle for the right to vote in Fayette County, Tennessee that began in 1959. And that's almost 100 years after the passage of the 15th Amendment. So the exhibit was important. It also had personal meaning to me because my parents were leaders of the Fayette County movement and that pres preserving that history is personally very important. Okay, so what was the reaction of the people who saw it? Well, at the University of Memphis, where it was first displayed, we had many people from the university and greater Memphis area go to the rotunda in the Ned McWhirtle Library to look at the exhibit. We had classes, faculty members took their students to the exhibit. We also partnered with the Student Government Association. They registered, working with the Hooks Institute and other organizations on campus, more students than any other state university in the state of Tennessee during the period of September, and they won the award from the Secretary of State's office. So we're very proud of that. So the, what was the reaction of the people in Fayette County? Yes, the exhibit also went to Fayette County. And I was very pleased to see that despite the history of opposing African-American participation in the electoral process, people in Fayette County were very receptive to the exhibit. The exhibit was on display for about um, six weeks. And in four of those days, my colleague and I taught a class. We taught 350 high school students about the history of the right to vote, the struggle for the right to go vote by African Americans in Fayette County. And in that time, the students got a chance to talk to us. They also got to look at the names that were listed of African Americans who were blacklisted because they registered to vote. And the students were shocked to see that grandparents, great aunts, great uncles, cousins that they knew risked everything simply because they registered to vote. From slavery to sharecropping to living in tents. You know, labor issues are often so closely tied, tied to that of race and social justice issues. That's true, Ms. Wells. I mean, you saw that in 1892 with the lynching of Thomas Moss at the curve. He and his associates were lynched because they started a grocery store that competed economically with a white grocer's. So the day the issues are a little different, I'm pleased to report things have gotten better. I think you'd appreciate that. <laughs> but the issue of work and who can work is very tied to whether or not marginalized people, especially minorities and poor, have access to quality education and whether or not they can obtain jobs that pay livable wages. So the Hooks Institute in November 2018 issued policy paper on automation. Automation is a 21st century issue here because it's projected that auto automation, artificial intelligence in Tennessee alone will eliminate or replace 50% of the jobs or 1.7 million people in the workforce. In fact, the Office of the President under a previous administration estimated that in the United States alone, 47% of the US population will be affected by automation. Those who will be most affected will be minorities and the poor. And so that's how automation relates to civil rights and equality. But why the need for working groups? Well, civil rights is a 21st century issue. The, what is a civil right changes over time. And so through working groups and actually through promoting the concept of automation is impact on the workforce through a TEDx talk that I did at Memphis Sears Crosstown and talked to many people about the impact of automation. 
Also, the Hooks Institute is working with members of corporations, um, nonprofits, and the Greater Memphis Chamber to look at how automation impacts our nation today and America's workforce. So we don't believe that the future is predetermined. We create the future, and the Hooks Institute is working just like you to make sure we have a positive future with respect to automation and its impact on minorities and the poor. Well, this is very interesting work. You know, my I myself have written extensively on the subject of justice. And I'm sure you're aware of my internationally acclaimed anti-lynching crusade. Absolutely. But did you know about my work concerning segregated train cars? I was once removed unceremoniously from the ladies' train of a car simply because of the color of my skin. And I refused to sit in the vile men's car because they were smoking it up with their horrible cigar smoke. Am I not a lady? I demanded to sit in the cleaner ladies' car, but the conductor forcibly removed me although not before I bit him. <laughs> but truth be told, my pen has more bite than my teeth. And of all of my efforts, I think my writing has had the most impact. Ms. Wells, your writing has been incredible. In fact, one could say your writing changed the world with respect, certainly in 1892, of how African Americans were treating and the practice of lynching. And your writing is so valuable that we understand at the Hooks Institute the importance of recognizing writing that memorializes the legacy of the American Civil Rights Movement. In fact, I'd love for you to meet one of the committee members on our Hooks Institute National Book Award. He's a member of the law school, he's on the faculty there, but he also helps judge his books. So I'd like for you to meet Daniel Keel. Daniel Keel? Hey, Daphne, Rory told me that I had just had to meet somebody. This is Miss Ida B. Wells. Oh, wow. Keel? Hi, Ms. Wells, it's great to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Oh, wow. So, a book award. Yes. Well, the Hooks Institute believes very strongly in the power of writing to change the world. And so every year, the Hooks Institute awards a national book award for the book that um, most best captures the spirit of the American Civil Rights Movement. We get submissions from all over the country, dozens and dozens each year, from some of the best presses out there, Harvard, Oxford, University of Chicago, University of Tennessee, other trade presses. It's really an incredible group. Really? So you must receive books from the most impressive of authors. Oh, yes. Uh, the National Book Award allows the Hooks Institute to invite leading scholars from across the country to talk about economic, racial, health, and other disparities. Okay, and what author was selected for this year's award? Well, this year the winner was James Foreman, who wrote the book uh, Locking Up Our Own Crime and Punishment in Black America. Uh, the book is an incredible take on some of the very important history that led to mass incarceration. Um, his arguments were groundbreaking in so many respects. Um, it was incredible. He came, he shared some of the ideas from his books here at Memphis, at the University of Memphis. Well, this seems like something that my friends at the Lyceum would be interested in. We meet monthly, and books that inspire great conversation are always welcome. Thank you for your time, Mr. Oh, Q. I think they would enjoy this one. Let me leave it here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. There's so much great work going on to promote conversation about social justice. I wonder if the Hooks Institute connects with the public outside of Memphis as well. Hello, Ms. Wells. My name's Nathan Ball. I'm the Media and Programs Coordinator for the Hooks Institute. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Well, I know you spent a long time and worked very hard to sell subscriptions of your newspaper, the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight. And I know that was a very important paper in the African American community. Well, the Hooks Institute shares stories of civil rights with thousands of people every week. And most of the time, we don't even leave our desks to do so. Wait, so the Hooks Institute creates media as well? What kind of media do you use? Well, we use what you call social media to share the news and uh, civil rights events with the public. Um, we reach people in Memphis and throughout the nation. So what's posted on this social media? Well, we post a variety of topics, um, such as reflections on civil rights events and reflections on social justice issues. We also have videos and photographs from our events. We have interviews from Hooks Institute staff, keynote speakers, and we also have interviews from civil rights activists, many of who almost gave their lives to fight for a more just and better world. 
So how many people do you reach with this social media? Well, in particular, we actually did a video about the lynching of the curve for the 125th anniversary. And that is viewed over 80,000 times on YouTube at the moment. We also reach probably all together, we have about 7,000 followers, contacts, and other subscribers that we reach through social media, through email marketing, and we also have print media after that. Wow, over 7,000? That's, that's impressive. Well, thank you. Now, I really wanted to talk to you in particular about a project I think you would be very interested in, which is a documentary on your life. On my life? Well, I'm, I'm honored, but have you done documentaries before? Well, yes, uh, the Hooks Institute has done many documentaries. Um, our documentaries look at civil rights movements and heroes, and we try to teach and move forward social justice in an educational and entertaining way. Um, so we've had films that are broadcast across, across the country. We also have won several awards, such as Duty of the Hour, which is a documentary film about civil rights activist Benjamin L. Hooks, um, and also our namesake. And that is broadcast on KCT Los Angeles, including other public television stations. Now, KCT Los Angeles is the second highest viewed public television station in the country, so we're very proud of that. Um, uh, we have several other, other films as well, one of them on the Tent City uh, Fayette County Civil Rights Movement, and also a documentary on the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s and how that impacted music, fashion, and culture of the time period. Now, this is all very impressive, but what does it have to do with me? Now, we are producing a documentary film on your life, specifically a feature-length film on your Memphis experiences and how you, how Memphis the city helped to develop your character and helped shape your anti-lynching crusade and later civil rights activism. Now this sounds like a very worthy pursuit and I'm sure a lot of effort goes into creating your platforms. So just make sure mine is the best. Well, of course we will. <laughs> and I'm also very proud to be telling your story with the Hooks Institute. Anyways, I must be getting to a dinner. It has been excellent to meet you, and I look forward to seeing you again. You <laughs> as well. Let's get a move on, Mr. Ball. Ms. Wells, you got to meet Nathan Ball? Yes, and Ms. McFerrin, it seems like the Hooks Institute is carrying on some great work, but I'm sure it doesn't finance itself. It took me a very long time, months, to grip my person to over 4,000 to carve a living for myself. Now, how does the Hooks Institute finance all of this? Well, let's talk about that. <laughs> the Hooks Institute receives funding from the University of Memphis. We also have a very vigorous grant process where we identify corporations and foundations that we submit grant applications to. And we also appreciate and are very dependent upon the donated dollars of individual people that I will meet at tonight's dinner. Now, people can donate in a variety of ways, individual people. Unlike you, where you had to take the train and go see people personally and collect the cash and try to build up your subscription base to 4,000 people, we make it very easy in this 21st century. First, people can go online and make a gift at the Hooks Institute website, memphis.edu forward slash Ben Hooks. People can also pull out a device that we call a cell phone where you can talk to another person. They can be in the next room, in the next country. Yes, that's possible. So you can pull out a cell phone and make a donation to the Hooks Institute by going to our website and clicking on making, make a gift and putting in your credit card number. And we even make it even more easier. At our dinner tonight, people will have a program and inside the program is an envelope. And in the envelope is a, is a donation form. And they can fill that form out. And they can find a staff member. Or they can find me. And they can even leave a donation tonight. So there are so many ways that we make it so easy for people to support important work that we do at the Hooks Institute. Well, this is all very good. And I think I have everything I need to complete my article on the Hooks Institute. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Ms. Wells. And I would very much like a copy of your article because I'd love to share it with people who support us so they can see how you've written about our important work and how we work to uplift the community. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Absolutely. You as well. Thank Have you. Have a good night. Thank you. Well, there is some exciting work going on at the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute. And I'm glad that my exertions can be continued by the dedicated individuals such as those who make up this wonderful institute. And I add my voice to those begging, asking for support. Now, I must go and take these notes down, or else I'll be late. <laughs>